as you heard, I'm Shani Graham. I have a very strange slash business slash community kind of group called Ecoburbia. So my partner and I own a house which we call Ecoburbia and we're in the process of developing that into a kind of sustainability hub, I suppose, part cooperative housing, part community garden, run by benevolent dictatorship, which is probably a very different model than what you'll be looking at. Um, and we also run a lot of community events, free movies and workshops and tours and things like that. And we also try and make enough money to live on the side. Why grow food? Okay, not necessarily in the context of community gardens, but just generally. Just write down as many reasons as you can why we'd grow food. This list may help you if this is something you're looking at in your community, in your centre, okay? It might help you with advertising, might help you with thinking about how this, li this list links to the needs of your community. So we've had a range of things from what the food actually provides to what it might provide for people as far as sharing to the community that might develop as far as friendship links and past links and handing on knowledge. Okay, And it's really great today because what, what you've got here is a whole pile of people, I suppose, who would agree with all of those things and have gone about creating those things in their lives in different ways. We started out with a reason for growing food that had to do with our fear about peak oil, our fear about transport issues, our fear about our ability to actually provide for ourselves. So this is the first salad that I was able to make from the garden, okay? I was so proud of those carrots. <laughs> right? um, and that was the first time that I had, I remember that was the first meal that I'd ever had. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that yourself, but it's a wondrous feeling. Um, we soon ran out, of w ran out of room, okay? And that was what happened to us. I wanted to have that experience night after night after night. And basically we ran out of room. So very selfishly, we took this philosophy, which I used to use when I was a school principal quite often, about begging for forgiveness, not asking for permission. Okay, so this is kind of the ethos around guerrilla gardening. So someone would say to me, did you ask for permission? And I'd say, oh, permission. I didn't even think about that. Do you think I need to? Oh, you know, and so, and I did that with a couple of council officers who came around too, and we got away with it for quite a long time until we ended up with this garden. Okay, so that was managed by my partner and I mostly, and sometimes one or two other people. It was on a, basically a verge, walkway down to, down to the street, and I grew all my vegetable needs for two years from that garden. So I'll hand over to Sophie from East Freer Farm. So we're in East Fremantle, and it all started because a woman called Del Weston was studying and was uh, at CUSP and was really inspired to start up a local community garden. And uh, she put an ad in the paper and I saw it and I thought I'll go along and see what they have to say and that's how I got involved. Um, and in 2010 there was an expression of interest that we did uh, with a letter drop and we started up an interim committee and then in March 2010 we had our first public meeting and there was such strong support at that public meeting that um, we thought well we have to do this it's just incredible and I was I was truly amazed I mean I, I thought I'd be pretty unusual that there wouldn't be a lot of other people like me in the community but uh, I think there were about 50 people came to that first community meeting and uh, they filled out a questionnaire and the support was just incredible. The first thing we did, the, the interim committee, I was on the interim committee um, and Beck James who was a, a very powerful force in our community garden, she and I went round with our kids and looked at a few other community gardens here in Perth and we looked on the internet at various websites. I went over to Melbourne because my family's over there and we had a few a look at Ceres and the St Kilda Gardens just to get an idea of what was involved. There's lots of different models um, and you need to pick one that's going to suit your site and your, your community. In August 2010 we had our first annual general meeting and that's when we became incorporated as the East Frio Farm. Um, up until that point we didn't have any land, we didn't have a garden, we didn't have anything except an interim committee and an idea. So the first thing that the, 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 um, the farm did was submit a proposal to our local town of East Fremantle uh, to establish a community garden. We, they told us we should go and find a site and we found the perfect site at Sumpton Green which was part of a rec recreational A-class reserve. It's next to the East Fremantle Oval for those of you who are city folk. 
we went and made a presentation to council and they gave us uh, some feedback including lots of requests they wanted to know about what our water use requirements would be they wanted to prepare us to prepare a business plan it seemed like there was a lot of things that we had to do just to get through just to get a garden set up and while they were supportive and helpful um, we thought that putting together a business plan was a really big ask for a, for a bunch of volunteers now we've got some very good people on our committee but um, a business plan for you know five years into the future was was asking a lot so we we kept with it we, we attended several more council meetings we made a few more presentations um, and eventually council said look something green's just not going to happen there's there's too many other um, things that are happening in that particular area. So we didn't get that land. So then we started looking at other land uh, and we, we did look at a few more council sites, but we could tell we, we probably weren't gonna get very far with those. So Dell Weston went to the local cafe, which is uh, on a double, it's not on a double block, but it only uses the front half of the block. So the back half is, is vacant. And they said, yes. And that made life so much easier for us. <laughs> We pay a peppercorn lease to the cafe and uh, we were able to, to set up almost instantaneously. So the first thing we did uh, was we put in a sub meter on the water main so that we could pay for our own water use. Um, and that was, I think, a carton of beers to a plumber's, made of a plumber who did it for, you know, free, far from the beer. And on the 9th of April, we held our visioning session on site to find out what people wanted. And on the 17th of April, so a week later, we had our first busy bee and we cleared the site and we put up a shed and we, thought, we felt like we were really getting somewhere. And that's, that's what it looked like when it had been cleared. And the council, I have to say, was very helpful. They did come and um, clear the site for us and they gave us a huge load of mulch. The, the local men's shed, Victon Men's Shed, put up our shed for us and uh, it blew down in the first. They, didn't, they hadn't actually secured any of it to the... To the um, the slabs that we'd put down. Um, and this is a photo from much later in the garden, but I just wanted to show you the shed did go up and it does, it's, it's been fine ever since. But um, it, it, yeah, when Beck rang me and said, oh, the shed's blown over in the storm. I thought, oh no, but we got it back up. Uh, the, one of the other first things that we did was put in, we got a grant for um, some compost bins and some worm farms. And uh, they, were, they were pretty much the first thing that we did on site. Um, just to talk a little bit more about the relationship with the cafe, you can see the, the, that house at the back there, that, the front of that is the cafe and the driveway down the side is our access to the garden. Um, they provide us with the land, they give us coffee grounds, organic waste, um, they provide a toilet, they give us electricity, although usually we just throw a um, cable over the fence from another person who lives up the road. And uh, in return, we give them fresh vegetables and herbs and lots of customers for the cafe. There is always someone at the cafe and there always seems to be someone at the garden. So it's a win-win relationship. So just to tell you a little bit about how we operate the garden, uh, it's open to the public at all times. There's no gate. We did talk a lot about initially about whether we wanted to have um, an access all the time. Um, but in the end, we've, we've gone with it being open. Uh, it's, it's quite small, it's like a suburban backyard, so it's a good demonstration of what people can do in their own backyards. Uh, our setup is that it's mostly communal, but there are some private rental plots. We do community busy bees once a month, and there is a daily member roster for watering. That's how we get over the um, problem of the garden not being watered. Because we don't actually, we have some rain tanks, but we don't have reticulation, it's all hand watered. In terms of other activities, and this is, this is a real key to community gardening, I think it's not just about the garden, it's about so many other things. Uh, we've done workshops on worm farming, on composting. Uh, my husband did one on frog ponds. We've done one on fruit tree pruning. We do stalls at the local farmer's market. We have a, a regular newsletter, which you can all subscribe to, um, go to our website. In terms of funding, we got an initial $5,000 from the town of East Fremantle. So while they weren't able to help us with land, they have been helpful and supportive. Uh, we also got a waste authority grant for the compost bays. Um, we've got private sponsorship for the shed and the, the boat, I should actually say that we did get money for the, she did, while Dell bought the boat, she then got sponsorship for it from our local real estate agents. 
and uh, we've recently had a land care grant for planting community citrus trees around the suburb which again is one of Beck's brilliant ideas. Uh, she put up a proposal, she got it funded, she, we've, we had to find land that was um, either private or non-council land and we uh, would go and um, dig up the soil. We had money for the trees and the compost and uh, the local community members would, would um, put in citrus trees. And we've got some on church land at the end of my street. I found that site, so we're happy with that. Uh, we've got some on the school grounds. They're all around the community. And those citrus trees will grow and then provide fruit back to the community. Yes, in terms of funding, we're now pretty much self-sufficient. We don't need any money. We, um, we generate enough from our annual membership subscriptions and from the occasional stall that we have. Um, it doesn't actually cost that much once you've set up the garden and it didn't really cost that much to set it up in the first place. We're looking at under $5,000 really. So it's a great, and in terms of the benefits that you get from the community, it's a huge. Uh, yeah, so there you go. We, we raise our funds through the membership, through the rental plots, the stalls. Um, the biggest annual cost we have is over $700 for public liability insurance, which fortunately, touch wood, we've never had to use. Uh, and the other main issue that we have is, is the regular difficulty you have with volunteer organisations of filling the, the committee positions. So in terms of messages, um, all gardens are different. So if you're going to set one up, uh, find one that suits you. There's, there's lots and lots of benefits. Um, you, while we, I tend to see the same people each week, when you see them at the shops or walking down the street, you, know, so you say hello. Uh, it, it, does generate a huge positive influence in the community. Um, there's always going to be barriers and hurdles, but don't be disheartened. There's lots of different avenues for funding. It's amazing when you start looking, you'll, you'll find lots of ways of, of getting money. Um, and it is so much more than a garden. Uh, and I just wanted to finish with um, some photos. Uh, that's Nancy Tucker on the right. Um, and yeah, and there's, there's some more photos. Uh, this that one's from very early on when the garden was just being established. This one was from late last year. That polonia tree in the middle is now massive. It's about five metres tall. It just grew over summer. So Hilton is a suburb of um, Fremantle, the city of Fremantle. Um, it's a very um, diverse suburb. There's lots of um, state housing there. Um, it's got a pretty, well, if you talk to some of the people from surrounding suburbs, it's got a bit of a bad rap. There used to be quite a lot of crime. The south and Carrington are two quite busy roads um, the city of Fremantle. Um, and there's a PCYC, which is sort of a, a community hub there. And, and the school um, is located right in the middle of Hilton, and that's where our community garden is. This is where we set up um, our community garden and, and where it's grown since. Um, this is the PCYC here. Um, this is a local sort of housing co-op and this is Hilton Primary School. So this was the, the fly that popped through our door. Um, there was a, a harvest festival, which was, I guess, um, the idea about sort of selling the, the community garden to, um, to the residents of Hilton and the surrounding suburbs. And that was held at one morning um, in May at the, PC, the local PCYC in the, in the car park. And it was a, f a really good turnout. There was a fantastic community atmosphere. There was some entertainment, um, some local music, lots of food and, and seedlings and stuff for sale. But this was really before the garden actually started. Um, basically, we were allowed to use part of the school land. Um, it was owned by the Department of Education, that's my understanding. The council were certainly very supportive, Fremantle Council. Um, and after that community festival, um, I think there must have been some more correspondence or a, a mailing list that we joined. And it was a, we had our first meeting to decide how we wanted the garden to look. So whether we wanted communal beds or we, whether we wanted everyone to have their own bed and people pay, pay sort of a plot membership sort of arrangement. That uh, meeting was held in a room one weeknight at the PC, PCYC. It was only about 20 people that attended or local residents in Hilton. Um, so it was really just about thrashing ideas around and I think um, we might have asked a couple of people to donate their time and, and skills to draw a couple of mud maps about what sort of what a garden would look like and, and that sort of thing. Um, after that, we sort of said, yes, we're going to do this, and we started getting equipment donated. So there were some ads in the local paper, um, and the amount of equipment that we got donated was incredible. It was so diverse. We got old tyres, roof tiles. I think people thought that we wanted anything and everything. 
Um, and so I think the first couple of, of months when we had busy bees, we were going around to people's houses and picking up bits and pieces and picking up old timber, pick, picking up tin. Um, I guess the difference between Hilton Harvest and some of the other community gardens that I see is that everything was pretty much either donated or made from scratch or it's upcycled materials. Um, there's no nice new shiny fancy tin beds and all the beds and um, a lot of the material, all the structures were either donated or made by uh, made by um, members of the garden. We, I think the first, one of the first things that we did as well, we applied to Lottery West for funding um, to get the garden reticulated because um, we thought that um, it's, it wasn't on private land and we really needed um, to be able to grow food throughout the year, we needed reticulation as well. So that funding, I think I wrote the grant for that and it was about maybe for about $10,000 or $8,000 and um, we received the funding for that and, and that was one of the first things that we did um, in one of our earlier busy bees. We got two sea containers donated. Um, I'm not sure where they actually, how, where they came from, <laughs> but they just arrived on site one day. So they were sort of our storage shed. They're really, they're pretty old and banged up and they're really rusty and stuff as well. But this particular shed here, we were down there, I think for the second or third busy bee and we were starting to make our, our beds from recycled tin and timber and stuff like that. And um, someone phoned up and said, oh, I saw your ad in the local paper and, and I've, I've got an old shed that you guys can have. So, I don't know, there might have been about 15 of us down there that day and my wife and I, it was just around the corner and they said, oh, can you, you know, the guy said you can come around and start, you know, basically, t you've got to take it apart though. And so we went around there and this shed was probably about the size of this room and we were looking at it going, holy crap, what are we going to do here? And the guy was really good. He helped us to take it apart and said, you've got to unscrew this and you know, you've got to drill this and then take this. And he sort of piled it all up in one place. And then we, over a couple of weekends, we moved it up to the garden. And then probably an even more funny or frustrating story is that we, the, the lady who was coordinating the first Busy Bees, Maggie, she was like, let's just set it up and get it set up. And you know, then we've got a structure and we can, you know, it was in winter we were working, so there was a wind and rain and whatever else. And then we've got someone we can have a cup of tea and whatever else. And so she said, let's just set up here. And we sort of said, oh, but do you think we should put some pavers down or, you know, do plan this a little bit better? Because it was a big structure. It was going to take a lot of work. She's like, no, let's just do it. So we did it. And then we came back the next day and the shed had blown over. <laughs> and then we're like, okay. So the next weekend we had a special busy bee to fix up the shed. And then she said, okay, let's just move it up here. It's just, you know, more sturdy and the grounds, you know, not sloping so much. And then we put it up again, like each time taking about three quarters of a day. And then... Um, the school said, this building is not safe, you've got to do something about it. So we had to take it down again. So it went up three times. And this is Simon, the guy on the ladder here, he's, he's a, a real legend and he's, he's, you know, just, he's, I guess, very hands-on um, and has helped put, to um, put a lot of structures in place and make sure they're safe and secure. So this is a sort of picture of our community garden. We've got about, I think about 20 of these beds, um, corrugated beds. We've got three communal ones because the consensus was that people that were joining the garden said we want to have a place to grow our own food. A lot of people, some of the people that were part of the garden were renting and they, didn't, they felt they couldn't do that in their own homes. So um, they wanted a, their, their own bed that they, and our fees are similar, I think it's about $50 a year for, for having a plot at the garden and for being a member. The area that we're talking about is quite a large area, it's probably about oh, maybe 50 or 60 metres by 80 metres, so it's really a, a, a part of the school off away from the, the main school um, playing area, um, just on the edge of the, the boundary. And one of the first, interestingly enough, one of the first issues that we had was we were building these structures, you know, we were putting food in the ground and people were saying, well, you know, surely we're going to have to put fences up because people are going to nick the food and it's going to get vandalised. And really, there's been such a you know, limited amount of vandalism. Um, it's a real community hub. and. It's a real, you know, created a real focus for the community and I think that people go there, walk their dogs, they pick food there, they, they garden there and there's always having that presence there has meant that there hasn't been a lot of vandalism. So we have monthly busy bees as well, the second Sunday of each month. I think when you join as a member to the garden, you're supposed to sign a pledge that you'll come to at least one or two busy bees each year. Um, but that's when most activity in our community garden happens. Um, you know, a lot of people either work um, there's certainly some people who are, who are retired and they, they might garden there during the week but, but most of us either work or have kids or have busy lives so the second Sunday is generally when there's a big crowd of people down there and that's when we try and tackle jobs around the garden as well as obviously um, looking after our own beds. 
And this is one of the communal beds. Another interesting little thing as well is when we put these beds in place, they're all pretty basic structures really with a bit of um, timber in the corners and, and just um, drilled bits of tin. We tried to make them safe by putting some, some old retic that was also donated along the tops. And the three communal beds, um, a lot of herbs and some also some vegetables there that anyone, regardless of whether you're a member or not, the idea is that you can just come and pick food from the garden for your dinner or whatever else. But we named all the beds, I think there's about 25 or 30 streets in Hilton, and we named all the beds after each, one, one, each street. And um, it became obvious after a while that people were saying, oh, I live on, you know, Snook Crescent. Oh, this is my bed, I just take from whatever I want from this particular bed. And so we had to rechange the names and name them um, different insects like butterflies and praying mantises and stuff because people were saying, oh, I've planted all this food and it's all disappeared. <laughs> so once we, we started building those structures, I guess, to make the garden really come alive, um, we felt it was really important. The, um, we had some, some money from, I guess, the festival that happened you know, early, in the early days um, to um, order some soil. So all the beds were actually provided, were fully soiled, full of soil with good quality soil. Um, they're all full of compost um, and each of the, for a lot of the busy bees we, we try and run workshops similar to these for one mulching and worm farming, making compost, what to plant when, pruning fruit trees, that sort of thing. So it's really grown um, a lot in the last sort of three or four years. Um, there's a committee, I've been on the committee for, for three years and that's one of the challenges as well is sort of maintaining that enthusiasm for I think for projects like this. So a few pictures of our garden. Um, these are some of the, our, one of our f first harvests from our plot at the local garden. Once we had those, the, the beds, the garden beds in place, we then set about developing different projects because we had the land to do it. So we've got a mini orchard in place. Um, a lady um, who was a member of the garden, her, her parents grew asparagus up north and she had a, a glut of excess asparagus seeds. So we made our own asparagus patch. At the Busy Bees, we swapped excess food um, in summer there's movie nights um, at the garden which is great um, and we're also involved in, in things like the um, Frio Festival and the Holbert Street Fiesta where we have a stall and that's you know certainly a really important part of the garden as well. One of the big structures at Hilton Harvest and, and probably the most impressive is a chook ship so two of our members had spent some time over in the States and um, learning about earth ships. I guess it's the sustainable house for chickens. So we used um, recycled tyres, rammed earth into all of them. It's just got a sort of solar passive design. It must be the fanciest chook house in, in Australia, I reckon. <laughs> and it took about probably eight months to build. Like, you know, we weren't going you know, hell for leather, but, um, you know, it was sort of rendered with sort of um, a natural sort of earth um, and then sort of screened off so to protect the chickens, because people walk their dogs through and stuff as well. And the idea is that the chickens eventually will fence the little orchard and the chickens can sort of free range around there. So we also got some funding for a community to do some community sculpture workshops. So I've got to build a little cubby house there recently. Recently got a waste authority grant to do a little, uh, some compost shelters um, and a worm farm bay on the side of one of the sea containers. We've also bought a trailer which can be used as a community resource we can collect food scraps and stuff for the compost, but it can be hired out to members for about $40, I think, a day. We had a visioning exercise in 2012. This was probably after we had it, you know, a few years after the first meeting. And then I think one of the most important things of Hilton Harvest is each year we run a twilight fair. So this was after the first festival. Um, you know, for the last three years, we've run a, a fair on the last weekend in March. And it's such an amazing community event. It's, it's really, Hundreds of, hundreds of people, people come from you know, all over the suburb and all over the surrounding suburbs as well and it's such a great community um, atmosphere at it. It's, it's, there's local music, there's local businesses donate prizes um, and I think it's one of the things that people love about Hilton and they sort of associate. But it is a lot of work to, to put that on. So there's Hilton Harvest Facebook page and there's a website and there's a newsletter as well if you'd like to, to join that. So just do a search for Hilton Harvest. Quick, few quick benefits. We've met lots of um, new friends and made lots of new friends. We feel that we're a lot more connected with our community. I think probably for me that's a greater benefit and, and been a lot more significant for me than, than the food we're getting. The food's sort of like a nice bonus. We're part of a community of like-minded people. The garden's really created a focus for the, um, for the community and we're also trying to 
encourage other people, elderly people and, and disadvantaged disabled people to also be, to be able to participate. So we just made some new beds that allow wheelchairs to get in and out and people to, to um, pick and, and plant. But there also has been a suite of challenges. Um, so staying, it's such a big area, staying on top of the, the cooch and the weeds. So the schools really let us use this bit, but the school doesn't maintain the area. So, you know, over winter and over spring when the grass grows really long, we still have to mow it by hand and whip a snip around all the beds and that takes a lot of time. Deciding, we always want it to be a, a sort of organic um, space, so not using Roundup and, and pesticides and stuff to control weeds. So that's been a point of contention. contention. Maintaining enthusiasm, I think we're at the stage now where three or four years, it, it's sort of a, a point where you know that we've got through that first, first few years where people are really enthusiastic, they join, and, and now it's a, a case of sort of saying, well, who's you know, serious about keeping this sort of thing going? And I, I get a sense of that. I think 80% of people that are part of the garden are, are overdue on their fees, so we're always trying to chase up. And even though it's not a, it's it's just something that we feel that that we should try and try and do. Um, governance and coordination, having people on the committee, and just recently we um, have a bit of an issue with our lease arrangement with the Department of Education because it was a very informal um, sort of handshake agreement with the school. Um, when we started it and now um, a couple of people from the Department of Education are saying we're, we're not too happy, we don't think there's a, the lease agreement is strong enough. So that's something we're sort of battling with at the moment. So yeah, thank you. That's so our story. Um, okay, so I'm from Rainbow Coast Neighbourhood Centre. So uh, that is in Albany, as it says there. So it's not quite the same setup as a city, city garden. We um, the demographic in Albany is um, quite aged um, and there's a quite a strong um, uh, culture of gardening already. So a lot of people have their own backyard gardens already. So there's, um, even though people rent as well, um, there's still that expertise in the community. So back in, I guess it would be mid 90s, our then manager, Kate Ham had an idea to start a community garden. Uh, she was very passionate about that idea. She's, she was manager for Rainbow Coast Neighbourhood Centre for about 12 years and it took her a, um, a few years to actually get it off the ground. She had uh, meetings with the local government um, and there was a lot of discussion about where it could go. I mean, Albany is certainly not um, terribly built up. There's lots of potential there, but unfortunately the only sites that they could come up with were along a um, uh, like a creek reserve and so they put lots of caveats on the um, on the on the project like uh, only growing natives and and what sort of things could be grown in the garden so it's kind of defeated the purpose of having a food garden um, so she started looking to the private sector uh, local business people <coughs> who own um, various tracts of land around town. So a lot of negotiations happened and she put in a lot of work uh, to that point. This is the land we ended up um, having. It is in the, in the CBD of, of Albany and the fellow who owns this business, the car automotive business on that side, he uh, owns this block of land and said we could use it. Great, great block of land, nice light, uh, nice thermal uh, mass wall there, good north facing site. Um, um, and so we started. This was actually before I came on board, so I'm a bit hazy on the total details. But, and then we came to the point of trying to gain some funding. Uh, and because we didn't have tenure on the land, um, we weren't able to access sort of funding sources that we were looking at. So uh, a lease was signed up with. With the, with the business owner. Um, we, have a, we have a six year lease and then we have option for another six. We, uh, the terms of the lease are that we pay um, the utilities, like the rates and the water rates upon that land in exchange for free use. And I think somewhere in there, there was thrown in um, the odd box of vegetables, which <laughs> you know, kind of happens sometimes. So this was the first Busy Bee, um, there's some some, uh, what you call it, conveyor belting matting <laughs> laid out. And you can see the lines. 
Um, the centre actually, coordinate, uh, actually employed a community garden coordinator uh, who uh, did the initial layout and coordinated the first busy bees. So there was a number of busy bees um, to put stuff in place. As you can see, the goes back to the fence back there. So it's a reasonable sized, reasonable sized. Um, um, our, re our first coordinator, bless him, was a, a horticulturalist. So everything's very linear, lineal. Everything's lined up in, you know, um, he's a lovely fellow, but yes, very sort of linear, which is something I probably would have looked at if, if I had a chance to have a design of it, going along the more permaculture sort of lines. Um, so yes, this is various play groups. I guess because we're a community centre, we had a community of members and participants that we could draw upon. Uh, we took our play groups down there. We have a young mums um, parenting support group and they would bring their children down and do various things. So play groups went down there. The kids got to dress up as ladybugs and things. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was all really nice. Um, getting lost in the broad beans there. Uh, young mums came down and built scarecrows and that kind of thing. Um, it was probably about this point we entered into a partnership with um, the local TAFE to deliver some on uh, garden learning for uh, participants with disabilities. So I've this is a really important point. It, it enabled us to fund a community garden coordinator on to be actually at the garden on a certain day. And we had three years of funding through that and I can't stress um, how important that partnership, funding partnership uh, was to the garden to keep it going through those years. So we started, uh, once we had a bit of infrastructure there, we could apply f and, and a tenure on the lease. We had, um, we applied for funding through the Waste Authority to deliver workshops, again, helping support the community garden coordinator. Um, this is our fridge worm farm. Um, so that was a, a workshop. This is another partnership with a, um, a group through WorkLink. They were a work for the doll um, group and they came in and made a beautiful circular garden for us. They learned paving skills. And so that was a, an infrastructure um, component that you know we supported but we didn't actually have to pay for which was great I think we might have contributed a little bit to some to some um, you know materials so this is uh, the garden a little while on the front garden here yep the first two-thirds are communal garden so we run work workshops through that and that's um, uh, pretty much overseen by our coordinator and the groups that he runs through there and the uh, and the around the garden group which was our gardening with disability people with disabilities group so they took take care of that bit and the last third is divided up into allotments there's about 15 and they are for rent uh, on, on a yearly basis um, I guess being an organizational community garden most of our allotments are taken up by community groups who come down and bring their groups We've relied a lot on uh, donations. This was a large water tank donated by the Water Corp down in Albany. Um, so we just had to have that and we're, we're pinching um, next door's roof space that just goes into that water tank. Watering, even though Albany is considered a quite a wet place, watering was actually a, um, seems to be a bit of a key theme. Mm. You know, who's gonna water it? The first couple of years we were watering by hand from a small water tank um, that ran off the, sh the little shed that you saw earlier and that was hard work um, and yeah it, you know part of the garden just really just didn't make it over summer and I can't tell you how excited I was when I found this little fella uh, you know wildlife coming into that grassy space uh, is just fantastic and we have quite a few resident um, birds that come through and um, we had a we had a bee hive for a while. This is an olive tree that the then minister came down and planted an olive tree in our garden. Um, I can't even remember her name, it was a few years ago. But there's a picture later on of what the olive tree is, it looks like now. This is um, just a bit, bit further along. Uh, and then, momentous, uh, momentous um, event. We got a Lottery West grant to put a little demountable building on site 
finally we had our own toilet, running water. Oh, it was amazing. So we were very grateful to Lottery West for their support. Um, and it really has made a difference. The first, first part is a, um, a small commercial kitchen. There's um, a small office with a library and then there's uh, a unisex disabled access toilet. This is the produce swap that started um, probably a couple of years ago now. Uh, first Saturday of every month we get together, um, pick stuff from the garden, people bring their own stuff from home. Because I guess the people who are interested in gardening in Albany are the people who have actually already got their own gardens at home. So they bring their seeds in, they bring their excess produce, you know, lots of jam swapping happens and stuff like that. So it's really good, really exciting. And the, and the amount of wisdom and um, mm. uh, information and experiences that are swapped at those sessions is just invaluable. I, I just love it. Yeah. This is, um, I had to show you, this is, was a delicious spread of salads we had from one of our workshops um, and that was actually Adult Learners Week last year. We did a, like a curry workshop or you know curries from the garden and salads from the garden as part of the Adult Learners Week workshops. Uh, and this is a little bit of paving um, we had at, this, at the end of the building that was just um, a pile of pea gravel. Um, and Lottery West were kind enough to um, let us spend a little bit of money that we hadn't spent on the building on getting it paved. So they were very flexible and they were very helpful. So this is a pop-up cafe we had for um, the uh, Spring Into the Garden Festival this year, which we were rained out on, unfortunately, but there, that's Albany for you. So I guess um, we've had a lot of the same issues as these guys. Yeah. You know, there's you know, continuity of volunteers, um, tenure of land, watering, you know, all those kind of things. But I think probably from our experience and coming from, a, you know, an existing organisation already, partnerships, 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 you know, we couldn't have done half the things we ha have achieved um, without those, you know, talking to people, you know, getting people in to use your facilities and, and how they want to you know, it's just, just a matter of talking to people. So community is all about the groups within your community as well as the individuals, I think. And um, what's really nice now is that we're in a position and we've got that history to actually help a lot of other communities, um, community groups get their, get some funding. You know, we, we, su we provide support letters and, or a venue. I live in Hilton which is where the Hilton Community Gardens are. And I want to get, I've got an idea for an alleyway project in Hilton because I live in the O'Connor part. So I want to have like, because there's lots of unused space. And so I imagine lots like public artworks in all, on all the garage um, doors and everything, solar lighting and garden beds going up against the walls. And it's, I find that when I talk about it, young people are really enthusiastic, but the demographic in my neighbourhood is people, um, it's a much older part of Hilton, where your part is a younger part of Hilton. So, and when, as soon as I mention alleyways, um, people, people in alleyways, rather than seeing it as being a, actually benefiting them around the more people that use the alleyways, the safer they'll be, there's this fear of noise coming from the alleyways and people in the alleyways. How, have you got any suggestions how I can get um, that group, which is a very strong group of people in Hilton, to be on board with the, with the idea rather than being scared of the idea of the change of it? Maybe consider, you know, it, even the way you, you, you're terming it as alleyways, you know, it mm. can sometimes maybe come across as a bit threatening to people. Okay. I mean, and and almost talk about creating green spaces or, or you know, art, uh, spaces where you have public art and green spaces that are going to link different parts of the suburb. Mm. I think, um, you know, being part of the City of Fremantle, then the city is something the City of Fremantle would be quite supportive of. Mm. Um, they're quite progressive as a local government. And I also think that there's probably, you know, looking at, Talking to to you know groups like Hilton Harvest, talking to the PCYC, because there's you know there's certainly um, young people that use the PCYC that would probably be really keen to be involved in the planning and 
you know, and development of that as an idea and a concept. So um, I know that certainly talking about linkages between our community garden and the PCY, so even though it's next door, but creating some sort of a, you know, a physical walkway or path, um, then the PCYC is really, really keen on doing that. And it's just some, some issues at the moment with the school about creating new pathways that, that are stopping us from doing that. But maybe think about the way you're sort of selling it as a concept and, and... Yeah, I guess with the alleyway thing, I guess because globally it, it, it's, a, it's a trend, it's interesting. Mm. And also, you know, yeah, I understand it. I think I'm a little bit attached to the whole sure. alleyway thing. I like that. So I think if yeah, you, yeah, if you, flexible. if you can manage to, well, if you can manage to create some, whether it be some native plantings or some fruit trees or, or something that, that people are going to regard, it's not going to be a threatening mm. proposal or a, a project. Yeah. Like I found the thing with the community garden is that a lot of people sort of hummed and hard about having, you know, a, a um, you know, big old structures or old sheds or sea yeah. containers at, at the school. Yeah. People saying, oh, that's just ugly and we don't want that in our suburb. But once it's there, people would come through, they'd walk their dogs, they'd bring their kids and say, this is actually really beautiful. Sure. Just a quick things from me. What about a, competi a competition or a tour of different alleyways in Fremantle? Because I know quite a few that are amazing. Don't, I'd say don't start with the garden, start with art because it's less threatening as far as something might drop in my thing, yeah. less people there, et cetera, et cetera. Tim Frodsham has a whole proposal about that because he used to live in that area. Um, we had a public meeting, got some basic infrastructure funding, got to um, have a water tank, seven raised garden beds, got a worm farm, had a surge of energy around it and things changed in people's lives. Um, there's just a couple of people involved. People can't actually come into the centre because it's closed on the weekend, but we've got a back gate. But where it is at the moment is I'm really holding the garden, which I love, and it's great. But we utilise it for community lunches twice, twice a week at the centre. But if no one sees that it's not watered, if it needs watering, I'm, I, it's not really desolate, it's very beautiful, th lots of things are growing. We're calling a public meeting again on the 20th of November. I don't really know where to go. I don't know if I'm the one imposing it, although there were 30 people that came to the mm. first meeting. I'm sort of in a stuck place, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I guess coming from an organisational standpoint, there is that issue of that disconnect between community ownership and organisational ownership. So I guess, um, which we really haven't solved yet either. And we've, we've um, gone through by having a, a coordinator in, in place. So that's the, ro the road that we've gone down. Mm -hmm. So to be able to um, access funding where a coordinator can be there. There seems to be a common theme that you all have rental plots. Um, I just envisaged a community garden just to be one garden that people would, you know, just come and yeah, help out and um, pick the produce. Um, now, with the rental plots, so it's, I heard $50 a year for a plot. Uh, what are people's expectations on that plot? Do they sort of expect you to supply any goods or is that just sort of a ruling that you have that that's your piece of land and you need to um, look after it completely on your own. Got this right. The idea for the communal plots originally came out of the UK system from the Second World War where people didn't have their own land to grow food and vegetables. So they started up these communal areas. Um, and when we were looking at um, whether or not to have communal plots, we thought, well, we'll, we'll give it a go. I don't think there was any other reason um, for that because most people in East Fremantle, it's have got fairly large blocks. Um, most people have got room for their own gardens. But we thought, well, we'll put a few in because there might be some people out there who do live in apartments or who don't have their own land who would like space to grow their own vegetables. And a couple of people have come forward. We don't, I think we've only got four or five um, plots that are owned, uh, that are rented by people. Um, they're responsible entirely for what goes into that plot and they're responsible for watering. So when we have our watering roster, People who come and water the rest of the garden don't water those those beds. So if the people don't come, the families that own them don't come, then whatever's in them dies. Now that hasn't happened so far. Um, 
there's always something growing and it usually actually grows better than what grows in the rest of the garden. But <laughs> um, and there hasn't been any issues with, with, take, with people taking produce out of those. They're marked with a red, with red paint, so it's, it's fairly obvious. Um, I guess it really depends on you know, whether you're in a highly urbanised area where people don't have access to land and would like to be able to come and rent a plot. I guess with the membership th thing, we didn't know how you know, where the garden would go when we started. So we thought by people paying $40, $50 for their plot, that would help to, you know, keep the garden going. Um, certainly all the gardens come, you know, fully, they come reticked, they come um, and uh, they're full of really good quality soil. And we also provide, often provide mulch, so ensure that, you know, the produce survives and things like that. So I think for that sort of, you know, for that contribution of $40, $50, and it's, you know, people are happy to, generally happy to do that. It's just that, membership rolls around every sort of six months or there's a, a period and people sort of forget to pay it. It's an owner system where you go online and do a d direct deposit thing. So I don't think people are, are unhappy about having to pay that fee. Um, for the communal plots, I think we did talk with the idea of having more communal plots, but generally find, we find in our garden that people will buy seedlings or the stuff they want to grow in their particular plot. And if they've got excess, they'll put that in the communal garden beds. Um, I think if we did have more communal garden beds, um, I'd be a little bit concerned with Hilton Harvest about who would, who would look after them, who would, um, who would harvest this. You know, quite a few of the communal beds they don't get harvested, um, and you know, people it might be people that are harvesting from their own plots. They just take a little bit extra, or they'll um, do a little bit of maintenance on those other ones as well. But um, I know that certainly all the gardens are different. Mm. Um, our allotment holders don't get much from us, really. <laughs> I mean, they get use, uh, discounted use um, for the, the kitchen area and they get free use of the facilities and stuff like that. Um, they're responsible for their own watering. They, they, we have a set of, a page of guidelines. So there's garden rules, like no smoking on site and um, keeping the um, weeds in their area under control and that kind of thing. So just um, maybe we could have a little round of applause for these three.